1984, Apple released a product that represented a new era in computing. But only a few years later, the company was already looking to replace its operating system. This time, let's take a look at what could have been the future of the Macintosh. By the late 1980s, Apple was pushing to diversify. It did this with its product line by introducing new computers like the Macintosh 2 desktop and expanding on its popular LaserWriter printer series. But it also wanted to increase sales in markets it had traditionally been weak in. The Mac had gained a strong foothold in graphic design and publishing, but Apple needed to appeal to a wider business audience for the platform to keep its momentum. The popularity of IBM PC clones was growing quickly. For small workgroups, the Mac's Apple Talk networking was ideal, but it wasn't robust enough for larger groups of computers or for connecting Macs to the servers and mainframes found in big corporations. So in 1988, Apple released AUX. It was more than just additional features slapped on top of the existing Mac OS though. It was entirely new and based on Unix, which itself had seen rapid adoption for use with servers and workstations. AUX was short for Apple Unix, and it was seen as a way to bridge the gap between the two. Apple had contracted with a company called Unisoft to port Unix to its Mac hardware, but that was no easy task. It was actually quite the feat of engineering. In order to put it into perspective, we need to talk about how the Macintosh itself worked. You're probably familiar with how the typical PC has a BIOS, or basic input-output system. In computers from the 80s, the BIOS acted as a bridge between the parts inside and the operating system. Specifically, this is known as a hardware abstraction layer. But that's all it did. The operating system had to be self-contained. If you booted a computer running, say, DOS, it would load the data it needed to operate from disk into RAM. That was a somewhat slow process, but more importantly, RAM was expensive, and computers generally didn't have much of it. So in order to fit into available memory, OSs had to walk a fine line between features and functionality. But the Macintosh was different. Because Apple controlled both the hardware and operating system, it could tie the two together in ways the typical PC couldn't. Underpinning the classic Mac OS was something called the Macintosh Toolbox. This was a collection of routines that defined how the OS and user interface worked. The Mac's designers realized that some of those routines would be used so frequently, yet change so little, that they could be stored in the computer's ROM. Therefore, on Macs, the ROM wasn't just a BIOS, but also a core part of the operating system. It handled things like the bootloader, the behavior of the menu bar, and even drawing the mouse cursor. The ROM was so integral to the operation of early Macs that it actually shared address lines with the RAM, acting as a sort of extension of the computer's memory, albeit a read-only one. It was this integration that made AUX unique from other forms of Unix. In order to boot AUX, the computer had to first start up a lightweight macOS installation, and then a special secondary bootloader could kick off the Unix startup process. But when that was done, users were left with a very interesting environment. The computer was running on the Unix kernel, but it still had the friendly Mac graphical user interface. And that's because it was actually running the Mac OS in a virtual machine. AUX could execute three different kinds of applications, a typical Unix program, a classic Mac OS program, or a so-called hybrid app that could take advantage of both systems. The built-in CLI program called Command Shell is a good example of this. It's a Unix process, but takes advantage of the Macintosh toolbox for its user interface. In typical Unix fashion, users could have their own accounts, which wasn't an option with an ordinary Mac. The macOS virtual machine started when a user logged in, and was compartmentalized in such a way that each user could have their own UI settings. 
but for simplicity, a default AUX installation would automatically log in as the root account. Network security wasn't really a thing back in the 80s. But why base AUX on Unix to begin with? If Apple wanted to sell computers that could communicate with Unix systems, why not just write software that would let the Mac OS do so? It all came down to one particular customer that Apple wanted to chase, Uncle Sam. As you could probably imagine, the US government needed to have quite a bit of custom software written for its various functions. You couldn't exactly go to a computer store and pick up a copy of something that could, say, calculate the income taxes for an entire country. Of course, it would be expensive and inefficient to have to rewrite all that custom software as operating systems came and went over time. So in 1988, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, adopted something called POSIX. That's an acronym for Portable Operating System Interface for Unix, and it was designed to set standards for making software compatible between operating systems. There were several varieties of Unix available at the time, each with its own differences, and they in fact competed with each other. This was called the Unix Wars, and it's quite the story in and of itself. POSIX's intent was to get software written for one flavor of Unix to be able to work on another, because frankly, no one knew at that point how the Unix Wars would shake out. Spoiler alert, BSD ended up winning. NIST published Federal Information Processing Standard 151, which basically meant U.S. government agencies had to buy computers that were POSIX compliant or jump through paperwork hoops to get an exception. The Mac OS on its own was nowhere near being compliant, but U.S. government contracts were generally very lucrative. So to Apple, AUX made sense. It could get them a foot in the door with the government and also potentially pick up sales from research institutions and higher education, both of which also commonly used Unix systems. But AUX also got Apple something else, a way out of a corner it had painted itself into with the Mac OS. The designers of the original Macintosh from 1984 were very creative in getting the machine to work within the constraints of its hardware but this resulted in many low-level technical limitations that were difficult to later work around. For example, the OS didn't get application multitasking until late 1987 with the release of MultiFinder. But even that was simply hacked on top of the OS and only offered cooperative multitasking. Add to that the fact that there was no memory protection nor any real way to add it, and it meant that a bug in a single program could cause the entire system to crash. Many Mac users got into the habit of saving their work frequently, as there was often no telling of when their computer would hang and they'd need to reboot. Unix fixed many of those problems. It had long since adopted memory protection and preemptive multitasking. Unix processes were sufficiently isolated from each other so a problem with one wouldn't affect the others. Under AUX, if a Mac program crashed, the worst that would happen is the Mac OS virtual machine would go down with it, but the rest of the system would stay up and running. By the early 90s, Apple was so hopeful about the future of AUX that it announced plans to make it available on a variety of computers, everything from a typical Mac desktop to powerful RS6000 servers as part of a now infamous agreement with IBM. That story itself is quite the rabbit hole. One will jump down another time. Despite all its promise though, AUX ultimately flopped. As far as I can tell, there were a few reasons for this. A big factor was cost. Apple had decided to base AUX on the System 5 Unix kernel from AT&T. It was the most popular form of Unix at the time, but Apple had to pay licensing fees for it. Furthermore, AUX was a bit of a resource hog, requiring more RAM and hard drive space than the Mac OS. So much so that a typical AUX installation on an 80 megabyte hard drive left only 10 megs free for users to store files. Apple sold an AUX upgrade kit for the Mac 2 that included a larger hard drive, four megs of RAM, a memory management chip, and a copy of the software, for about $5,000 US. That'd be almost $11,000 today. And 
that didn't even include the cost of the computer itself. And along those lines, AUX only worked on specific Mac models. You couldn't install it on just anything. The Mac needed to have a floating point math coprocessor and hardware accelerated memory management, which generally were only present in the most expensive models. And even then, only certain parts would work. While my Mac SE30 is officially supported by AUX, the third-party CD-ROM drive I tried to install it with wasn't, due to a lack of drivers. I had to switch to a specific model of Apple-branded drive. AUX actually had a bit of a rocky start. It was supposed to have been launched in 1987, but got delayed by seven months. And when it was released, it wasn't exactly fully baked. Its initial version could only run one Mac program at a time, and it didn't even support color. Because of the way Mac programs were commonly written, only an estimated 10% of them would run on AUX, though this did get better with subsequent releases. A number of publishers had initially jumped on board to write software for the OS, but they started dropping out once they saw it was going nowhere fast. And that's because it was really a niche OS for a very niche audience. Apple didn't sell proper servers at the time, just desktops, so they couldn't competitively bid against computing monoliths like IBM or Sun for big projects. AUX was too complex and resource-hungry for the typical Mac user. They just wanted a simple, easy-to-understand computing experience. But AUX also wasn't powerful enough for the Unix diehards. They didn't care about the Mac's UI, and the hardware was too expensive and limiting. AUX did eventually receive favorable reviews, and a small portion of power users loved it. But most everyone else wanted something different. Even the whole US government POSIX compliance thing never panned out. While the plan was to get all government workers using Unix-based computers, relatively few did. Many simply needed to use typical office productivity programs like word processing and spreadsheets, which were things Unix wasn't terribly user-friendly at. So DOS and Windows still managed to count government offices as part of its market share. The icing on the cake happening in 1993 when Windows NT became POSIX compliant. And beyond those reasons, there were two things working in parallel that ultimately sealed AUX's fate. First was Apple's transition to the PowerPC platform. AUX had been written specifically around Macs that used Motorola 68K processors, but PowerPC was a completely different architecture. To get AUX running on it would have involved a massive rewrite of the software. For a while, this was actually expected to occur. In late 1991, Apple said AUX version 4 would be released around 1994 and run on machines produced by Apple and IBM. Part of that whole infamous agreement rabbit hole story thing. But at that time, they were still on AUX version 2, and Apple had done very little marketing of that operating system. Meanwhile, improvements were still being made to the classic Mac OS, such as System 7, which was released in May of 1991. And that's the second thing that really killed AUX. Apple simply didn't focus on it. Even though for a time it was considered the replacement for the Mac OS, it was never treated like it. Other OS projects continued or cropped up. Since AUX's launch, there were no fewer than four attempts to define a new future for the Mac before Apple finally pulled it off in the late 90s. Over time, Apple had become very dysfunctional, and AUX simply fell by the wayside. Its final release was version 3.1.1 from 1995. It was primarily intended for a machine called the Workgroup Server 95, which was really just a tweaked Quadra 950. It's hard to say just how many AUX systems actually ended up in use, but by the turn of the millennium, it had largely become forgotten. Yet just a few short years after its first attempt at a Unix-based operating system had fizzled out, Apple saw much more success the second time around. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.